Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's discussion focused on safeguarding confluence. Uh, for those who are attending this live, you will receive a copy of the presentation and the recording at the end. Please stay tuned for that. Uh, but let's actually just get started. So my name is Andy Fernandez. I'm the Director of Product Management here at Haiku. But for this discussion, uh, talking about cloud, uh, cloud security, cloud responsibility, I wanted to bring somebody from the Atlassian ecosystem who's been doing this for a while. So I have the pleasure of also introducing John. Um, John, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do today, kind of your, your areas of focus and, and also location, very important. Howdy, thanks, Andy. Uh, my name is John Johnson. I'm a principal systems engineer at ISS Technology, uh, a platinum premium partner in the Alaskan ecosystem. I work primarily in the data and integration space. We handle the majority of migrations, infrastructure build outs, and integrations into the cloud ecosystem, as well as self hosted ecosystems. Um, and right now, getting this point, I am calling everyone from beautiful Buenos Aires. Very jealous, John. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you have any questions for John, please use the chat as well. We're going to have a full discussion today, not necessarily talking about Confluence as why use Confluence, but really talking about it from a security perspective. A lot of organizations, you may have migrated already to Confluence or you are thinking about migrating to Confluence on Atlassian Cloud. Today's discussion, what we want you to leave with is really understanding how it's being used. What are the things that you're exactly responsible for? What are the activities from an identity perspective, from a backup perspective that are Atlassian's responsibility versus yours? And then we'll get into how Haiku is going to be able to help your organization do so. But the first thing that I want to mention too is, you know, sometimes, especially from my perspective, somebody who's even newer to the Atlassian ecosystem, you think Confluence and you think potentially a knowledge base article. Right. This is where I put uh, a blog about something that I've created as a developer. But there's so many core use cases now that I'm seeing within Confluence, whether it's from a marketing perspective, from a project planning. I've seen run books. I've seen BCDR documentation on Confluence uh, from a product management perspective. Perspective, It's a critical use case as well. And also on the knowledge base side. But, um, John, you've been in the ecosystem for a while What's been your perspective on the growth of Confluence and, and maybe some of the best use cases you've seen for it? Sure, I mean, Confluence has always been Atlassian's attempt at so solutioning a knowledge management system that is linked in obviously to their flagship product, Kajira. But in terms of the organizations that I work with, FinTech, uh, logistics, shipping, telecommunications, I've seen it hold everything from highly compliant regulated data, PII data, uh, federally regulated, you know, design charts, uh, networking charts, basically a treasure trove, if you will, of really critical, uh, highly compliant, highly detailed data about not only an organization's standard operating procedures, but also you know, how their organization functions, what their strategies are, what their roadmaps are, and things like that. And the more that we're seeing investment into Confluence, the more we're seeing that kind of adoption to the wall-to-wall, wall-to-wall or lasting ecosystem. No, that makes total sense. I've seen companies like Canva exclusively use this as a single source of truth within an organization. What I notice too sometimes is that it's pretty sticky across departments. Um, but one of the things that I like to use it as a comparison, especially when we have conversations in the development side, it's when you think about how critical data is, we always tie ourselves to tier one production application, right? Whether it's my VMs um, on-prem or my instances in the cloud, that's the most important applications. The database that must be protected at all times but sometimes organizations don't realize how much critical data is hosted in things like github right whether it's source code perspective or also confluence especially because of the knowledge and how many years of information is kind of aggregated into confluence as well um, but this really sets the tone to john's point depending on on the use case depending on the organization there's going to be some very very critical data whether it's pii or simply how does your organization run um, what's your documentation like? What's the research that your organization has? Any single bit of this type of information can cripple an organization. I'll give you an example. From a marketing perspective, if we lose all of our messaging, all of our, our ability to understand where we execute campaigns, then that's a huge hit on our organization. Now, the same thing applies to the engineering side. It applies to the entire uh, organization. But what I really wanted to spend a lot of time today 
is also trying to decipher what's new, what, you know, John and I were both uh, at Team 24 this year. It seems like it was two weeks ago, but now I, I realize that was several months ago now. Um, but there was over 35 announcements. There was a lot of AI. There was a lot of things that were announced. And what, we, what I really focused on, though, was how critical um, and how important Confluence was to every single one of those announcements as well. Right. So when we think about what we saw with the announcement of Rovo, right, we're very interested to see what that becomes. Um, Confluence whiteboards, you know, the AI enhanced capabilities, smart links, um, even the Confluence company hub. I think that's a very tactical, important thing, but also Atlassian Guard. But John, from your perspective with uh, with Team 24 and how Confluence has evolved, what what interested you? What do you think were interesting use cases that you saw that were tied to the announcements there? Yeah, some of the really interesting ones were, you know, automation recommendations, template recommendations via AI, well, integrated with Confluence, built off of the existing knowledge that is, that's sitting within Confluence, and a greater interconnection and integration between Confluence Cloud and Jira Cloud, specifically as kind of the flagship product. And that all actually, to me, kind of just rolls up into, uh, you know, Atlassian's rebranding of of you know, but Jira software, Jira cloud, as just solely Jira as this wall to wall, one stop platform for people to get work done, right? And last thing being the platform where work happens, that's been kind of their focus. But it's been really interesting to see the amount of integration, even extended integration of Confluence into things like Compass, for example, um, for, I mean, I've been working with Atlassian products for over 10 years. And I can tell you when I first got my hands on Confluence, it just became a dumping ground of just put some notes in here and then you forget about it later. And it seems that Alaskan is kind of aware of that and, and trying to really build in tools to make not only the knowledge management, the addition of new knowledge, the, the sharing of new knowledge easier, but also the management of existing knowledge and the cleanup of existing knowledge easier as well. No, that, that makes sense too, right? What is the usual behavior versus the behavior that Alaskan is trying to drive? I mean, I've, I've used things as a dumping ground before, and I've also used it in the way that it's, it's meant to be used as well. And that's something that has come up and in, in with Robo, which is, you know, let's assume, and, and we have to see a lot of what's coming in Robo, right? Like we, there's a lot that we need to understand how it's going to work, but what's the role of Confluence with Robo? What does Confluence mean now? How critical is it if all of the use cases that are promised within Robo are to be delivered? I mean, as, as, as basically the base of knowledge, Confluence is effectively that thing that we'll be teaching Robo. And you know, your the answers or potential hallucinations from a large language model depend on how valid, uh, secure, and clean you know your data and your knowledge is represented in Confluence. Um, and you know, if you take that extra step and that extra care of making sure of figuring out what you actually are putting into Confluence, to go back to earlier examples of you know regulated data. And you know how we kind of worry about that, and the solutions that we'll talk about later with Guard. Those are things and considerations that you have to make because it's very difficult for for a large language model to unlearn something that it's learned. But if it's learned it and it's learned it correctly, it's a very valuable assistant, especially if it's based off of your company's internal knowledge. Um, just as a few examples, at our practice space, we're we're early adopters in in AI, and we've kind of integrated from a coaching, employee development, and values perspective, utilizing AI as kind of a first stop resource tool for, you know, HR, you know, explaining our values, giving examples, being a resource there. So I think it really depends on the knowledge and the, the veracity of the knowledge that you have in your knowledge base. 100%. And I think I like to explain the, the relationship too, the way simply how vector, actual vector databases like Pinecone work within the LLM, right? These vector databases are just a database like anything else. They respond quicker. Um, but if information is deleted, if an insider gets access to it or simply uh, due to a misconfiguration is corrupted, then the model suffers, right? And it's the same relationship now with Confluence, right? Depending on the quality of the data, depending on the integrity of the data, its last known updates, that has an impact on Robo too. So what we're seeing here is that Confluence is not just a space or a whiteboard or a place to, to dump. It's becoming really part of that system of work that Atlassian has highlighted and more, more important than ever. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about too, though, is obviously there's a ton of use cases, but like any other piece of software, 
there is potential to lose that data. And to, to John's point, um, if you lose that data, you can accidentally corrupt the model as well. And there are hallucinations that are caused. But really, even let's disconnect from the AI conversation. Let's just talk about how Confluence is used in today in regular life and regular work. You know, some of the cases that I've seen that I've noticed. And the one thing that I always mention, and we see this across the board, as long as there are humans touching software, at any point in time, there is always, always going to be the risk of an accidental deletion. Well, we always, I always used to put a picture of Dilbert up here. There is always, as long as there's a person there, there's always going to be a risk of accidental deletions. And we're going to talk about insider threats. We'll talk about ransomware and misconfigurations, but I don't think maybe John, you have a different perspective. So the end of time, as long as we, the humans are interacting with the software, accidental deletions will be the number one threat across the board. It's something that we see all the time in our customer base. When people are recovering, it's usually because there was an accident versus a ransomware attack, which is worst case, but also happens much less frequently than you and I accidentally deleting something because we went to get coffee, right? What's your perspective on that, John? Yeah, I think my perspective is a lot of the like a lot of cascading decisions kind of lead to these things, right? When I think of accidental deletions, it makes me also think of misconfigurations as well. Like what configuration allowed for or permitted that deletion to even be possible in the first place? And I think the ability to pivot and recover quickly from deletions, from misconfigurations, from from open security vulnerabilities is a very important thing. And I mean recent events uh, withstanding, right? I think a lot of organizations have got a chance to actually test to blow the dust off of the disaster recovery run book uh, and actually see that in action. And so if you're not prepared for these things, if you're not ready for these things and you're not able to you know, pivot quickly and recover, um, then it's leaving a lot, you know, leaving a lot of risk exposure to you and your organization, right? Because it's not just as simple as like, oh, we deleted this article. Okay, does someone remember it? Let's pull it back. You have to think like, if I have an organization of 10 years of engineers and all of the tribal knowledge of those engineers and, you know, the references here, the notes here, you know, there may be specific tribal knowledge. We might've only captured 70% of it. And if we lose that page, we lose that space, we lose that knowledge. Maybe we can only recover 40% of it from memory. We now have to spin down developer cycles to go re, re you know, look at all of the code base for the last in number of years that we've worked on to kind of pull back what little bit of that 70% that we could from memory, whereas opposed to, you know, just having a backup or a recovery point would save us in that regard. 100%. And I think that a lot of folks, when they think data loss, they think the only consequence is, oh, there's a disruption. We have to go recover. Let's go figure out. Let's ask Elastic for help. Let's figure out how to do so. But one of the biggest challenges is the amount of time you spent reconfiguring. And that doesn't, that's just not Confluence. It's a, it's your, it's GitHub, it's your AWS, your, your VPCs, all these things are highly configurable. And if you lose those configurations, as John mentioned, someone's got to go rebuild them. That's just not that you just can't continue your business without doing so. But the other one that, although I would say, I would hope is less frequent, it still happens all the time. And that's insider threats. And What's funny is when we talk to customers, everyone is fully aware of the human error component because they everyone's got a story where they've screwed something up. But the the piece that's always met with skepticism is insider threats. Um, but the reason this is so important is I always ask customers too, how many employees do you have? Do you know the names of all of your employees? And and the rule of thumb I've always provided was look if, if there's a point in time where you now don't recognize faces in your organizations, that's really the prime time where insider threats can happen. That is when you have disgruntled employees, things happen, uh, potentially it's layoffs or somebody is simply disgruntled within the organization, insider threats are much, much more likely than possible. And obviously the larger your organization grows, the more likely it is. And this insider threat isn't just simply based on, hey, I am an employee who's upset and I'm going to go and delete something, but it's also privilege escalation as well. Somebody who's been able to get access to that employee. And we've seen some very, very high profile attacks where they were done explicitly through privilege escalation as well. And then of course, the last one is from a ransomware perspective. Now, the biggest risk here would be a supply chain attack, but out of all of the things that we're delineating here, I would kind of effectively rank these by how likely they are to happen from human error to a malicious insider to a ransomware attack as well. 
Now, here comes the, the juiciest part of the conversation, really, because this is where it generates the most amount of questions, maybe resentment sometimes, uh, and confusion, which is who's actually responsible for confluence. And, you know, John's been doing this for a very long time. And you, John, you've been in discussions around helping organizations migrate and helping organizations run or even start over within, within that lasting cloud, whether it's Confluence or Jira, it always seems that we run into this discussion around Confluence, around Atlassian Cloud and what the responsibility is. But before we get into that conversation, I want to give everybody a little bit of perspective around other cloud platforms and the relationships that they have with customer versus system level security and data protection. And everyone's got a different infographic review, but they're all saying the same thing. So if you look at AWS, what does AWS, AWS say? Well, it says, hey, from a customer perspective, you're responsible for your data, for your access management, and for your endpoint security. Azure says the same exact thing. Google Cloud says the same exact thing. And also Atlassian. Every single cloud platform, every application that's running in the cloud is essentially leveraging the same shared responsibility model. Maybe, John, there's a lawyer out there who's made a career of shared responsibility models because they all are so, so similar, both in technical concept, but also on, on the legal jargon side. But the way I like to explain it, and before we get into that, John, what's been your perspective? Why do you think that there's just such a misconception of hey, I'm migrating or I'm running on, on Confluence Cloud, this is Atlassian's responsibility. Where do you see the pitfalls here that people have a misconception? I think the primary pitfall is that we're so used to managing security tied to infrastructure, because if we're moving from a self-hosted or an on-premise environment, we're that instance, maybe those nodes, maybe those EC2s or those, uh, those virtual machines, maybe they're in a private network on-prem, Maybe they're in your private VPC in AWS. You know, maybe you've concerned and considered the network implications. You have network security groups, ACLs, things like this. And so you very much tie the security of your product to the infrastructure for managing that product. And so when you move to cloud, you're thinking, oh, Atlassian is handling the infrastructure. They're handling the security. But it's very much not the case. I'll give a quick example with both Confluence um, and Jira. Um, anyone who's done a migration or anyone who's attempted to do a cloud migration has run into a warning if they've ever used any of the migration assistance or if they've read any of the documentation that any share permissions in JIRA or any space permissions in Confluence that allow for public access, you know, that will get you a flag on the migration assistant. And one of the issues there is that, you know, you can configure a space to be visible by anyone on the web, but your on-prem Confluence DC sits in an air gap network that you have to access to VPN. So really no one on the web can access it, but that means something different when it's in cloud. In cloud, that means bots can access it. You're saying that you want people to be able to visit it directly from Google on no VPN. You know, it's kind of oversized of that and changing the frame of reference for cloud. I also think the, the other consideration is, and the analogy that I've used before is, is that simply because I'm moving from, you know, a gated community, my house with a front yard and backyard, simply because I moved from my house to a, luxury apartment downtown does not mean it is the apartment's responsibility to secure my apartment. They secure the facilities. They have a security guard walking the grounds. You know, they're ensuring that, you know, the electronics and everything and the maintenance is there. But when it gets to the front door of my apartment in that luxury apartment, I am responsible for securing my goods. You know, I need renter's insurance. I need to make sure that I take audit of things. I need to put in a security measure, right? So it's kind of these things that are the crux of it and just moving to cloud into a SaaS platform is a change in the kind of that perspective because you're now decoupling necessarily the security from the infrastructure that you can control. I, li I like that you added luxury to the apartment as well. I'm very happy for that. <laughs> um, that's good. That's good. We have standards here. No, but John, I think that makes total sense. I think if, if you are constantly patching, monitoring for updates, if you are responsible for the networking, for the infrastructure, for the storage of something, that is at top of mind because you know it's your responsibility. If all of a sudden you click, people can access, you're not responsible anymore for, for these updates, then I guess it can be very easy to understand, well, you know, at last you know, is covering all of this for me. If I delete something, if I accidentally delete my assets or space, then it's on Atlassian to recover. And your apartment analogy is actually much better than my parking garage analogy because it's the same thing, right? Which is 
what is a garage or the apartment responsible for that you can access it, that the lights are on, that if you pay rent, you can live there and that you're safe. But if I leave my windows open or you leave your apartment door open and they steal everything, um, then, then the apartment or the garage will not take any responsibility for it as well. They will try, right? Just like at last year, at some points, we'll try to help in that perspective, but there's no legal responsibility for them to do so. So, and that's the biggest difference with like what John mentioned. It's the system versus the tenant. Yeah, they do backups. They do system level backups because they need those backups for DR activities. Those backups are not for, for Joe or Nancy who deleted a specific asset somewhere. That is not Atlassian's responsibility. AWS doesn't do it. Microsoft doesn't do it, nor should Atlassian. That's a very clear delineation. But the big piece here is it's not just about the security component, right? When you look at the shared responsibility model, I've provided a link here for all of you as well to be able to read this. If you are already running on cloud, I highly, highly, highly suggest that you take a look at this. Because the reality is that there's an incredible amount of benefit to moving to the cloud. Just as John mentioned, there is a lot of CapEx. There's a lot of resource and time that is spent managing something on-prem, right? Whether it's Atlassian, whether it's SharePoint Server, whether it's Active Directory, if you're managing something on-prem, that's a lot of time. Uh, and as we've seen from recent events, it also means that you have the burden of responsibility if you misconfigure, if you don't patch your data. In fact, John, something I've been focusing so much on ransomware recovery for so many years, when we did our research and still talked to customers, the main culprit still to this day is that people simply didn't patch on time and that they weren't regularly updating, especially when you think about things around ESXi and things like that. At the end of the day, human error is still happening. People go on vacation, people make mistakes, and you need to account for that. Now, you don't have to worry about that. That's now Atlassian's problem when you go to the cloud, but that doesn't mean you have to let go of all responsibilities, just as John mentioned. Um, but one of the things that I want to mention that Atlassian is directly responsible for, well, hosting. You do not have to manage the infrastructure yourself. They are taking care of th things at the networking level. If there is a global phenomenon, at the system level, whether that's an outage or an attack, they are responsible for incident response. They also have to make sure that these marketplace applications are verified, that you're not subscribing and accessing to something that's actually malware, like how we used to see in the Android days. At last, you have to verify these marketplace apps. And in fact, they even give designations of security to these apps. And they're also responsible for high availability and DR. That is not your responsibility. That is on Atlassian. From your organization's perspective, John's already mentioned so many of these. And John, we'll come in and discuss these explicitly, but you have to make sure that you use common sense. Just as he used as an example, if you leave the apartment door open, um, if, if your password is password and somebody gets in, there's nothing that at last you can do there. That also includes following best practices on MFA, verification of domains, authentication policies. But John, out of all of these, you actually already provided a very good example on, on the IP side, but where do you see people fall short as well in understanding what they're responsible for? Is it identity? Is it data protection? Where are you seeing folks kind of not really account for once they're running in the cloud? What I've seen a lot in moving to cloud is at least around security around these particular things has been a Kind of a a not a short sightedness, but a let's get quickly let's get quickly going, and then we'll come back to this later. And nothing is more permanent than a temporary solution, right? So, to give a, to give a quick <laughs> example, right? Probably the most important thing that we plan for when we're when we're helping a customer go from ground to cloud is we plan for and around, you know, uh, single sign on, multi factor, SAML identity identity provider management and authentication policies. And not just the singular authentication policy, not just enabling multi-factor, but we sit down with clients and, and map out with them, how are you expecting all of your users to interact with this platform? As an example, right? The only way for you to interact directly with the endpoints in Jira or Confluence programmatically for the most part is going to be via API you know, inter interaction. And for that, you need API tokens. Well, default authentication policy allows API tokens for everyone on your organization. Does everyone in your organization need an API token? I don't think they do. Probably the only people that need it are service accounts and developers that are building some bot integration to pull data from here to here. So thinking about that, looking at your authentication policy and deciding, hey, like we have multi-factor enabled, but how long do we want these session tokens to be valid for? 
Do we want these session tokens to be valid for 15 days? Do we want, you know, we're living in a world of remote work. As I told you all earlier, I'm in, I'm in Buenos Aires. Do we want someone with my computer, with all of my session tokens of my computer, if they get access to it for 15 days, have access to all of the instances that we have? No, maybe we want to drop that down lower. Uh, you know, what is your data uh, residency policy, right? Do you have regulatory compliance requirements that require you to have a data residency in a specific area? Um, another one that I think is often overlooked too is that Atlassian also does provide you a means to enable um, ACLs on your actual instance for enterprise with Guard Standard or Guard Premium, right? Like you have the ability to say, okay, Atlassian has their firewall and their networking setup, but we still want people accessing Confluence through, you know, the VPN IP. We, we don't want people accessing Confluence or Jira on mobile apps. We don't want people to be able to download something with mobile data policies, right? There's all these tools that are kind of new. There are new tools specific to cloud that if you're not paying attention to them and you don't think about security first and you think, oh, I'm in cloud, then you don't leverage them and they, they reduce that layer of protection that you can potentially have in cloud. No, that makes sense. And I think this shows the value of having an Atlassian partner like Exos Tech being able to actually drive those conversations. So many folks assume that these things are turnkey versus the ability to optimize for it. Right. And so I think that's a that's a critical piece as well. I'm very the API token one is critical. I think, you know, we talk about the 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 basic things, but things like API tokens are also extremely important. Um now, John, I'd love for you to kind of walk me through in the audience a couple of things here around Atlassian Guard, because there's something that we saw at the announcement around Atlassian Guard, and we've known Atlassian Access previously. And one of the things that Atlassian does well is they understand the things that you are responsible for as a customer, but they still want to be able to deliver the value and services that you need to protect your endpoint, to protect your organization. And that's where we saw at Team 24, the announcement of Guard. But John, from your perspective, you know, whether it's today or where 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 Guard is on the roadmap, what is what does Guard look like today? Is it access? Is it something new? What's what's that from your perspective? From our, from my perspective, it's something that's fairly new. I mean, obviously the Guard standard is simply just access rebranded. But when I'm thinking of Guard, I'm thinking of premium because premium is where those new features are. And to understand Guard, you have to understand Atlassian's at least my understanding of Atlassian's uh, strategic goals in alignment, right? For, for a while, the push towards cloud could, have, could be interpreted as a kind of carrot or stick and leaning towards a stick. We're decommissioning server. We've decommissioned server. If you are on server, you need to move to data center or move to cloud. And data center was positioned and still is positioned as the enterprise choice for Atlassian for organizations that require expansive complexity, and require specific regulatory uh, requirements and security concerns. Now that the now that the ecosystem is cloud and data center, the question that Atlassian is trying to answer and what they're trying to appeal with with cloud is how do we get these enterprise organizations, these 10,000, 20,000 large organizations, um, one of the highlighted organizations that team was United Airlines. How do we get these kinds of organizations onto Atlassian Cloud? How do we build a platform, an enterprise level platform that meets enterprise security requirements in cloud? And the answer that Atlassian came up with is Atlassian Guard. Um, and Atlassian Guard brings in a lot of those security features at the premium level that enterprises would expect, right? There is security and endpoint integration. There's, you know, alerts and analysis, remediation recommendations, leveraging, you know, Atlassian intelligence to identify you know, threats, anomalous behavior, deeper audit logging integrations, right? That you can pull from and review and, and analyze, right? Extension of data classification, right? A Latin Guard Premium identifies a way to, to state, as we mentioned earlier, PII or even potentially PCI data, right? These things can exist in your JIRA, they can exist in your Confluence. You know, who do you want to have access to view that? Confidentiality of classifications, state security policies, based on those classifications are all these new features as well as, you know, threat detection remediation and things of that nature. So I think that's where Atlassian's kind of positioning guard, particularly guard premium, to kind of appeal to these enterprise customers to give them a platform of, along with other features 
that they've announced and other products that they're trying to announce to give this wall-to-wall -wall enterprise solution for very large clients. I think it's the, the scale of maturity of any cloud platform is always to add identity access management. I think the, the challenge with Atlassian is there are so many people truly accessing it, whether it's your employees, contractors, suppliers, folks that you're dealing with, that there is a lot of potential for disruption, a lot of potential for disgruntled or insider threats. And I think being able to say, whoa, somebody's exported six, seven, eight different pages. It's not just about breaches. It's not just about the removal of data, but also even the, the, the theft of IP and the theft of PII, right? These are things that are happening across the board and mostly enterprises are the ones that are dealing with. Um, but this will be very interesting to see how this evolves as well. You see it in every cloud platform, right? Uh, AWS started off with IAM, they added IAM Center, they added so many other uh, additional areas and Azure has always been very mature with Entra, or Azure Active Directory integrated into this. This is that last year step there, but I'm very interested to see how, how it continues to evolve. Now, the last bit where we see, well, especially we see a lot of confusion is around the creation of backups. On-prem, everybody knows when you're running on server data center, you're taking a snapshot and you are responsible for those backups and you recover from those snapshots because why well, it's your house, you own it. Now, once again, just as John mentioned, if I go to LS and cloud, I no longer have to maintain the server. I no longer have to manage the, the backup appliance or the storage target. What does that mean from a, from a backup perspective? If I delete an asset, if I delete a project, is it Atlassian or is it me? And what Atlassian has been made very, very clear is that the customer has to create backups of their data. This is the area where we get the most confusion. I think people are very aware that they have to be, protect their endpoint, that they have to protect their security. There's a lot of nuance there, but where we see a lot of confusion is, wait, Atlassian should probably deliver my backups. Uh, they should be able to recover for me. And this is not just an Atlassian problem. This is every single SaaS application in the world has the same exact dynamic. If we go back, I don't know, John, seven, eight years ago, when Microsoft 365 really started going mainstream in cloud, it was the same thing. And what you could do was you could track Microsoft's website. And every quarter, John, they would move up the statement on, we will not recover data for you. And every time that time would pass, they would continue moving that statement to the point where it's on top of their 365 legal statement, which is, if you delete your emails, we will help you and we will try, but it is your responsibility truly at the end of the day to recover from that. Um, John, what's been your perspective, especially because you're dealing with so many customers who are migrating or have migrated. What's been the, the perspective on backup with them? I think it's been tumultuous. I think, I think several things have been uh, kind of pain points for them. So first, the the framework is a is a difficult thing. It's not something that I'm not familiar with. I mean, I cut my teeth in the tech industry working for an actual hosting provider, right? A very large hosting provider. And that's a very common conversation that we had. And people need to understand that not only is Atlassian a SaaS platform, they're now your hosting provider. And anyone's who's and anyone who's purchased hosting from a hosting provider will tell you that the hosting provider does not provide backups unless either you pay for them or out of the kindness of their heart in a specific uh, situation and the kindness of your hosting provider's heart does not a good disaster recovery uh, solution make, right? So I think that's the first thing is that it's just a change of perspective to understand that not only are you dealing with a, a kind of a SaaS platform, a, a software provider, you are dealing now with a hosting provider as well. The other consideration is that the methods of backups that you have available on premise may be this big, but as you get into cloud, that drastically narrows quickly, right? Anyone that's managed their own database backend, simply take the snapshot of a database, right? I can take a full snapshot of the database. I can take even incremental backups depending on the database backend, be it Postgres, MySQL, uh, Oracle DB. Like if I need to take these incrementals, I can, I can also, potentially install, you know, things like um, AppFire CMJ, potentially take snapshot exports of uh, individual projects, and maybe I can restore incrementally and things like that. I have backups, RAID redundancy, all these various things. In cloud, natively, you have one option. <laughs> it is the backup manager backup at this time, right? So 
your options of full backup scenario and your options of inter incremental backups natively are non-existent. You need to plan if you're going to do an incremental backup and restore incremental, you need to plan around that. And so that's kind of the, the more difficult uh, jagged pill to swallow. And with that kind of planning, and Andy, I know you'll touch on this in a little bit, you have to decide, do I want the operational overhead of planning around these these new backup methods? Do I want to worry about that, right? So, 100%. No, that's a perfect example too, because there are thousands of backup and recovery services on-prem. You have everything that you want to choose from, whether you're managing Atlassian data center on your on-prem uh, footprint, or if you're just leveraging EC2 instances, right? There's a wealth of resources out there. AWS has an amazing job with this as well, but nevertheless, what options do you have today, right? You have a backup manager. And there's two ways to, to handle this, right? There's the, the extremely old school, and I, I hope that no one is going to do this, which is manual backups, meaning that you have allocated somebody and says, hey, on Thursdays, you will manually download all of your projects on Atlassian to a hard drive. Um, I think everyone on this conversation knows exactly that that's a no-no, right? Uh, not only because you're now downloading data that's unencrypted onto a hard drive, but you, that means that every single time you're allocating somebody's time, it's very expensive to simply download something to a hard drive. And guess what? When you have to recover, you have to recover the whole thing, assuming there's not a corruption there. There was a conversation that I had, uh, John, in the last webinar, we were talking through Jira and talking about Backup Manager. And this was Dan, who's a solutions architect. And he told me the story where he had always done his backups manually in cloud. And there was a mass deletion, uh, deletion of issues that happened. And he went and found the hard drive where all the backups were from last Thursday and the whole thing was completely corrupted. So they had to rebuild their configurations for months. Right. So I think stories like that are going to happen when you're recovering from from a hard drive or from a download, uh, a manual download. The more sophisticated option that you have is actually being able to script those backups, being able to use that same backup API, build, schedule and manage. The challenge here, though, is one, it still takes a lot of time to build and schedule and manage these scripts, but it also takes it does not give you additional recovery capabilities. You simply have to recover the entire thing into a sandbox and work from there. These are not backup policies that you're leveraging. This is still taking a lot of time. From your yeah, perspective, yeah, John, also, go ahead. I was just gonna say, there's also restrictions around those backups as well, right? Like you, you have to consider the size of the data of the instance that you're working with. Very large instances will take a very long time to back up their data. Uh, you can take backups without attachments, for example, but you'll be missing the ID, the ID linking between those attachments. So if you restore, you'll need to reattach the attachments that you didn't back up. If you do with attachments, and you can only take it every 48 hours, but you may run into, for some customers, we've seen over terabytes worth of attachment data. You know, you're looking at backup run times that can take up to, if not longer than four days. Again, four days for a backup of your entire site. So, you know, not not ideal if something happens in those four days you can only take one backup at a time that's the that's another limitation right if i start this backup on monday i can't run another backup else i will wipe the previous bag but if i don't download it or the download's incomplete that's a that's a useless backup that i've just got so and uh do not interrupt that download <laughs> yeah <That's> exactly <laughs> <laughs> that's the other that's the other biggest piece too but and it's also to your point it's not just the, the amount of time it takes to back up but any recovery activity is a bulk recovery activity right um somebody is working on a very specific thing before a release you have to go work with your admin or yourself and you have to go and, and attempt to recover the entire instance and then identify the thing that was deleted as well. These are very, very time consuming things that on prem, it was just a uniform activity, right? Hey, here are my VMs. Uh, I'm taking a VM level snapshot. I'm taking snapshots to my database. Life is good. Life is easy. These snapshots cover both Atlassian, but also my 365 and everything else. Now we live in silos. And each of these silos, each of these uh, SaaS providers is its own hosting as well, as John mentioned. So kindness is probably not the SLA that you want, but you also do not want to spend a lot of time managing uh, backups manually or even the scripting. 
And I want to spend the last five minutes, really the bulk of today's conversation was really understanding the responsibility around how we've shifted our perspective at Haiku about this, even us being an Atlassian customer. Um, just so they hear a little bit about Haiku, we come from the world of protecting critical infrastructure all over and especially SaaS applications as well. And as you've seen, we're also on the Atlassian marketplace and we are funded by Atlassian Ventures as well. Um, something that we think through that is a core focus of ours is if you're an enterprise or a mid-sized organization and you have Atlassian, you have Git repos, you have all of these applications that we've talked about today, you need a backup provider that you can trust, a backup provider that allows you to recover things quickly, but that also gives you full control of that data. And something that I want to mention here is we've actually been doing this to John's point for a while since the birth of Haiku. We actually got our start when everybody was running their applications on-prem with critical applications, protecting physical and virtual environments, whether that was Nutanix, VMware, Dell, NetApp. That is something that we still do today for those data center customers, but we were able to deliver the backups and requirements that they needed there. But what we noticed was also these same customers or new customers were also hosting data center in the public cloud. And we wanted to make sure that we also delivered the ability to protect on AWS, on Google, or on Azure. And John, something that we'll probably nerd about at some other point in time, it's not just the compute and the database that we protect, but even the configurations around that instance that we protect as well. So for example, if you have a designated VPC in AWS, you can actually restore the subnet configurations of that. Right. So it's how do we continually protect? Because the way that we protect on cloud cannot be the same thing that we were doing on prem. It's a different beast. It's all API driven. It's a completely different religion for every single application that you protect. You need to be able to protect at the at the configuration level as well. But then we saw this flood of our customers going to cloud, truly on cloud, on Atlassian cloud. And we wanted to make sure that we continually protect our customers. In fact, we have customers that are using us to protect their data center. And then maybe that one instance, John, that they've migrated to cloud as well. So we are seeing the full, but it's definite that we're seeing much, much more gradual, even in Europe, believe it or not, people that are truly migrating to Atlassian Cloud. And the approach that we have here is every single application that you have is critical, but also has its own native APIs. And Haiku is actually purpose-built across all of these applications. We have 4,200 customers all over the world that are relying on us to be able to protect their most critical applications. And I have to refresh this slide because that is now 80 sources that are protected, right? Being able to protect Confluence, Jira, JSM, even product discovery and the artist formerly known as work management as well. We can protect all of these things as well and keep an NPS of 90, right? When you think if you are in FinTech, if you are in the public sector, if you are an organization that has PII, that has critical data, you need a backup that you can trust. And to John's point, one of the things that the Atlassian native capabilities does is it requires a lot of manual work. So one of the things that we focus on is how do we give our customers the ability to have an autopilot backup? And we work natively with the Atlassian API to do so. Now with Haiku, you can simply uh, create backups at the project level, but completely automated. The focus of Haiku is not that you are spending time on a backup interface. It's that you only come to Haiku when you have to recover something. Everything else should be automated. You should go and live your life and focus on the administrative side of the house. So what you can do is you can actually standardize your backup policies and you can say, look, this is a very critical project. I wanna take a backup every four hours. Or this one, I think from, from this perspective, let's take a daily backup. Then, especially if you have PII, especially if you have critical data, um, you have to choose a retention period, which is, hey, is the government or regulatory bodies requiring me to store data for seven years, for example? You can define that in the policy and then simply assign it. And once you assign it, it runs forever. You have built-in notifications and you have the ability to make sure that you can track that and you have full logging for it. But something that I want to really focus on is where does that data go? Where do those backups go? Because you will see backup vendors across all applications where they provide the backups and they're awesome services, but it lives in their account. So you now have an additional third party that has all of your critical backups in their control. And as we've seen in recent events, you want to minimize third party risk as much as possible. So our philosophy at Haiku is not simply, hey, we'll do the backups and we'll keep all the data for you, call us when you need it. It's, we wanna be a highway 
from your Atlassian, your critical applications, whether it's on-prem or public cloud, to your storage target that is only in your control and not accessible to anyone at all. So when you take a back, when you assign that backup policy with Haiku, data is encrypted at rest in its flight. It is stored in your S3 bucket. This means that you can store it in AWS, in Azure, in Google Cloud, or other even more cost-effective S3 compatible storages like Wasabi. You choose where Haiku runs and you choose the dated residency as John mentioned, where it's stored. And of course you have full control of the networking and access and IAM configurations. All of this is stored in S3 bucket. And one of the more underrated things here, if you're in a very, very critical space and you have to protect this data at all costs, you can even enable immutability on the, on the storage target as well. And you can define an object lock for that data. But the point here is you now have a copy of these backups outside of Atlassian and in your control. So I don't know, John, you cut your teeth in, in IT, so you know this, but so many people have already forgotten the three, two, one rule, right? Three copies, two media types, one offsite. And although this was fundamental, the first thing you learned you know, from an IT administration perspective, in the world of SAS, we've all forgotten about it. And it's very, very critical that we still keep that three, two, one rule here. And this is what we're able to do but giving you the ability to fulfill the three, two, one rule with your data in your storage bucket, where they're not vendors and people processing it completely outside of your comfort zone or your residency. And yeah, the I most would, important. I would agree real oh, quick. Sorry, sorry, Nate. I would just agree real quick. I would just say, like, I am, as stated earlier, I am with a separate Atlassian partner. But to me, the bring your own storage and the ability to store those backups that Haiku is able to generate for your product is the differentiator to me because I want to be able to control my data and I want to be able to access my data. If say, I don't know, my vendor, my backup vendor, I don't know, maybe he's running CrowdStrike over a weekend and I need to access some backups and I couldn't access them over the weekend. I don't want to be beholden to that. So I just want to call that out. Like that storage option, the ability to own your own backups is the differentiator too, as far as I'm concerned as an IT professional. No, absolutely. Thank you, John. And, and something to mention too is if we do this thought exercise, you know, whether it's it's your organization or mine, we're running multiple applications, right? Whether it's in the Atlassian stack, but also our infrastructure, we have a Git repository. You're using some form of a CRM. You're using all of these applications that used to live in that on-prem. In fact, one thing that we've noticed is we read through the survey and we've seen it in, internally as well. John, can you guess, take a guess at the amount of SaaS applications that a mid-sized organization is running right now? And when I say mid size think like 1,500 employees. How many SaaS applications do you think they're running at a time? Hmm. I would have to put it in the hundreds at a minimum. All right, well, I thought you were going to give me 10. And then I was going to surprise everyone with hundreds, but you were right. So thank you for that, John. But no, it, the, to John's point, the average mid-size, I'm not talking about a Fortune 1000 company, I'm talking about a mid-size organization, is 217 SaaS applications. And the scariest part to me is that 70% of those are paid for outside of IT, which means that IT has no control over those applications. And if you want to have a backup for each one of those, in another third party, in another storage, in another storage residency, that is creating an entire sprawl of your data that is extremely, extremely risky. So our philosophy is always going to be, can you grab backups of all of your data and then bring it all back to something that you can control? So we also believe, John, that that's a full differentiator for us as well. But of course, you got to be able to recover, right? You can check the backup box, but if you can't recover, you don't have a backup solution as well, right? So from our perspective... We also want to make sure that you're not just performing bulk recoveries. This is not simply automating um, using the Atlassian API. This is actually, can you take backups? Can you take them as frequently as you want, even with attachments? And then can you restore a specific piece of data or a specific configuration, right? From a Confluence perspective, can you restore an entire space or just an attachment that was deleted? Or can I restore an IT asset or object schema, you name it? The goal is that you can restore everything to a point in time. And that is the most important function here. What we do for, for Confluence, we do for JIRA, we do for JSM, we do for everything else. But I think the, the, the thing to, to, to cap us off with today is 
if there's anything that we take from this discussion, it, regardless of haiku, regardless of what you're doing, is that you have a full accounting of your responsibilities, as John mentioned. He sees so much oversight in areas where we want to move quickly, but being able to have a full accounting of what are we exactly responsible for will pay dividends in the future. We always assume that we see things on the news, whether it's breaches, attacks, uh, outages, and we never assume that it will happen to us until it does. So it's really, really critical that we do our homework and that we have always, always uh, a full accounting of our responsibilities. One thing that I want to mention here too is you can check our marketplace listing, but also even try this for yourself. If you have any questions for John, especially with his perspective and his ability and the, the work that they're doing at ISOS Tech, please send us a note and we'll make sure to connect you to it as well. But John, I wanted to thank you so much for your time today. I think this is a great discussion. We probably need to host another one where it's even more informal. We have a full discussion in all things AI and security within the Atlassian space. But I wanted to thank you for your time and, and everyone joining. You will receive this presentation shortly. Thank you, Andy. Thanks all.